Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Meg Mott, and I teach politics. We got people talking up front. I'll wait till then. <laughs> um, I teach politics at Marlboro College, but the thing that makes me most excited is to be able to discuss the Constitution and different ways to understand the Bill of Rights. Uh, and so we've been doing this at Putney starting, oh, there's John Blood's brother, <laughs> Alan Blood. Shout out to John Blood. This will be on YouTube. I just want to do a shout out to somebody I knew in the 70s at the meeting school. His brother just walked in the room. But I'll, I'll stay focused from here on out. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> So um, this idea of debating our rights happened because Emily, our Putney librarian, who we're so thrilled to have here, yay, Emily, and uh, the trustees of the Putney Library decided that after the election that people needed to be talking about the Constitution. And they needed to be talking across uh, political divides about the Constitution. So the idea behind this series is for us to think about a variety of ways of understanding our rights, knowing that not just one version is correct. So if this is your first time coming, you'll see that we're gonna go through some Supreme Court cases, and one of the reasons we do that is so that we get these uh, different perspectives out there. And we also hope, we did this pretty uh, brilliantly, I thought, with the Second Amendment, and I'm hoping that the Tenth Amendment will also generate some strong disagreement. Uh, at some point, Ray and I may do public debates. I don't know, we may just like <laughs> practice up, and then we'll have a little debate here, and we'll have a proposition, and we'll really go at it and, and do something like that. Um, but for these uh, events here at the library, the idea is to try and understand the many different ways we can interpret these rights. And that um, if we all leave feeling like, oh, there's just one way to interpret them, then I have failed miserably. And especially on the 10th, I'm really hoping that people begin to understand there are drastically different ways to understand what states' rights could be. Well, let's get started. Before we go through the whole series of some Supreme Court cases, I'm curious, what do you want from the state of Vermont that you wouldn't ask from Washington, D.C.? And I'm going to put some of this up here on this. Please. Yes, Ray. Well, it's not so much what I want from Vermont. Mm -hmm. It's what uh, a state can provide that the feds haven't gotten their act together yet. On. Yes, excellent. And until Obergefell, gay marriage certainly was on that list. Uh, legal marijuana is another one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the thing is, most of us, I, looking around the room, I think came up during the 60s mm -hmm. when states' rights was a fig leaf for segregation and mm -hmm. a lot of other things. So we developed an allergic reaction to it. Mm -hmm. But I have to say that under the current Congress and administration, mm -hmm. states' rights are suddenly beginning to look really good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, 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 exactly. So I put um, just a, a bracket there around racism because sometimes states' rights is understood to mean that. But yes, people go to their states for, uh, particularly before the Supreme Court rules and makes something national, I don't want to say universal, gay marriage, marijuana, other things that people go to the state of Vermont that they don't go We're to. to go to them for health care. For health care. You tried. Yeah, what happened? Well, they cut them uh, outside of their disappear, decided to the court. So, so trying to do health care through the state didn't work uh, uh, under, uh, what, was it, what was it called? Single payer. Single payer, right. Um, any other things you might go to for the, just for the state? Gun safety. Gun safety. You might go there for that. Well, abortion rights. Abortion rights. Oh, no. Agricultural issues. Agricultural issues. Oh, yeah, clean water. Federal laws on that. <laughs> what, what did somebody else say? Did I catch uh, clean water? Clean water. Okay, so I've got clean water. Yeah. 
Um, anything else? I can squeeze it in between. Something that you would want to go to Vermont for because you felt like you couldn't get anywhere with the DC. And I'm not fishing right now. I'm just curious, trying to figure out what exactly are states' rights. Well, you could have carbon issues. Mm -hmm. More mm -hmm. environmental issues. Carbon. Cool. Capital punishment. Capital punishment. <coughs> Good luck in Vermont. <laughs> right. Vermont, uh, I'm sorry, New Hampshire, the governor, I think we talked about that, just vetoed a law that came out of the New Hampshire legislature that would have um, gotten rid of capital punishment and he kept it going. Right. So that's off, that could be a states' rights issue. Um, and what would you go to for D.C.? War. Nothing now, really? <laughs> well, you go to, okay, well, actually, you know, I mean, uh, war, which we could also call national defense. Yeah. Uh, the federal courts have actually <clears throat> done a better job than some of the state legislatures have on uh, gerrymandering issues. Gerrymandering? Uh, so you it would. It's not on the Supreme Court, or it has, but it hasn't been determined. Mm -hmm. Right. So that is something that could be hard voter, to. Voter rights. Voter rights. Uh, because some states, you may think, wow, considering who's in charge, uh, you know, and if you go to Maryland, the Democrats have an advantage. Or if you go to North Carolina, they just so said... If you look at the last 50 years, the federal government's actually done better than, than many of the states on that issue. Right. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, anything else you might go to D.C. for? Right to die on the Vermont side. Right to die. Yep. Die with dignity. Uh -huh. <laughs> right to die with dignity. Yeah. Gerrymandering should also be on the state side because of the states that control it. I was going to say, I mean, a lot of these, you'd love to see the federal government do stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think a lot of times you go, yeah, yeah. you go both places. Yeah. You start with the state and also, but also go for the federal. Right. So, I mean, we saw that with moving to uh, the Affordable Care Act or other places where, and, and this is what the discussion is going to be, where do people go to get their political demands satisfied? Uh, over a, a long period of time, it was, it's been pretty much over here. So what does that mean when people aren't going over here to the state side very much? Anything so, else you want to put for DC? Clean air. What? Clean air. Clean air. Clean air, yep. And you had your hand up. Monetary policy. Monetary policy. Right. Clearly within the bounds of, of Congress to set that. Yeah. And Bill, yeah. Yeah, along with um, clean water and clean air, how about clean soil? Mm -hmm. Healthy soil. Right. And that you, this is something you would want on the national level. Oh, um, sorry. Um, or do you want that more in Vermont? Well, maybe both, but it, maybe it would need to start in Vermont. Because it is a little bit collected, you know, to agricultural issues. Yeah. Right. So it's like, when, when is it local and when should it be local? When should it be national? That's exactly what we're starting to try and make some sense of. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so far the division here seems to be primarily where do we think we can get the, the right answer rather than where should it come from. Ah, right, exactly. So we're playing a game here. Well, oh, what, Alan, what kind of a game do you think we're playing? <laughs> well, I mean, we're, we're going where we think we can get the right answer. Exactly. Rather than where we should uh -huh. Rather than who should rule for us. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So we're being much more practical. It's uh, not just that, because when states prove that it can work, mm -hmm. then it's easier. I mean, then it's, it's already been the research for it to be able to move ah. to the federal level. The gay marriage issue. Right, so the, so the research, yeah. The yeah. yeah, Pat wants to jump in on this. And well, then I just wanted to say, it's, it's not an either or because gay marriage in Vermont means nothing if there's not gay marriage nationally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Same with marijuana. Ah, so, the, so, and, so Kathleen just said same with marijuana. And this is going to be one of these questions. Is it true that if something happens in Vermont and it doesn't happen other states, we do have this full faith and credit 
um, clause in the Constitution which says the laws of one state, you should give full faith and credit to them if you travel to another state. But, but, but by the same token, this is designed so that states can do things differently. And that's part of the fun. I'm going to say capital F fun of living in a federal system. We should always be a little bit, uh, I don't want to say at each other's throat, but throwing into question who gets to make these decisions, what kind of decisions belong to the states, do all the states have to do the same thing, or can we actually have a diverse laboratory, and we'll get into that term of what could states really do. Did you have something else you wanted to add? I was just going to say for like food safety, I don't know if you would call that an agricultural issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But like, that's really big that's the in the, on the federal level. Yeah. Right. Food safety. Yeah. Eddie, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, as an example of that, it would be the marijuana, marijuana laws. Yeah. Uh, it's perfectly legal in the state of Vermont but the feds can still come in and arrest you for it. Exactly, exactly. Oh, we get to talk about that tonight. <laughs> oh, yeah. I figured that we were going to find some good case law, and I thought marijuana was a good one uh, as we go into the future. So um, Alan said, well, where should we go? Or is this a game that we're playing? And, and I mean that in a, a most respectful way. We, we are political creatures. We are looking to get our needs met, and we're trying to figure out how we can get the best outcome. So I have framed this, though, as a normative question. Should state sovereignty still exist under the administrative state? Uh, because, uh, as we'll see, it hasn't been good for the states if um, we watch what the Supreme Court has been deciding over the years. And some of them, you'll say, oh great, the Supreme Court made gay marriage uh, something that's national, but it took away the sovereignty of the states. So just as a reminder, um, what we're doing here is engaging in a public deliberation. And the reason that we do this is because when people get together, not just Supreme Court justices, but when ordinary people get together and really wrestle with these questions of what does the Tenth Amendment mean, that um, we should be able to make better decisions, and the fact that we're talking about it publicly uh, increases the legitimacy. It also encourages public-spirited perspectives on public issues. So having these kind of conversations gets us much more in tune with what's at stake for all sorts of issues, abortion rights, gun rights, all sorts of things, marijuana rights. Uh, promotes mutually respectful processes of decision making, which is something that perhaps we need more of, how to disagree but hold um, opposing viewpoints respectfully. And the, uh, the fourth reason, and this all comes from uh, democratic deliberation theory, we do this in order to correct mistakes. So that when we get together and we talk about the Tenth Amendment, we think about what these court decisions have been, perhaps we're going to start to want the court to, doing something, to do something differently. So would somebody be willing to read the text of the Tenth Amendment? Yes, Kathleen. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it, to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Yeah, it's an interesting one, right? Because um, first of all, it doesn't tell us something specific as many of the earlier amendments does do. It is a residual amendment like the Ninth, for those of you who are around for the Ninth Amendment. It says the Constitution or these bills, uh, the Bill of Rights enumerates all sorts of things, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, what it doesn't mention in the Ninth Amendment gets reserved to the people. Turns out there's something else that has a residual power, and that is the states or the people. Yeah, Howard. Most important word there is respectively. That is the basis of states' rights. Yeah, and do you want to explain that more about why respectively gives this to states? Because it does not say to the states uh, uh, collectively, it says respectively, which is to the states individually. Individual states, great, thank you. Um, yeah, Janice. So what are the powers that are prohibited to the states? 
Um, the first part of the Constitution, I won't make you do this again, Bill. I know I gave you the Constitution last time, and I said, can you please find the section where it says what states can't do? Um, if, and, and we won't go into great detail now, but it, I, I, it's either Article 4 or Ar Article 5. It says what states can do, and then there's also some language about... Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Commerce. Commerce. Oh, yeah. So um, this all sounds great, right? We have states, and the states have individual state rights, not as an aggregate. And then we have the powers that have been granted to the federal government. And it looks so beautiful in theory. In fact, you can easily find on the interweb some sort of picture that looks like balance and happiness of um, eggs all lined up next to a basketball. And it looks like that's going to work out just fine. At the time when this concept was introduced, uh, this would be James Madison and the Federalist Papers, uh, state sovereignty was understood to be key. Because we started as states, individual states, doing our own thing kind of states. And um, so James Madison, who was one of the Federalists and promoted the Constitution, he says, uh, that state sovereignty concerns the lives, liberties, and properties of residents of each state, as well as the internal order, improvement, and prosperity of each state. Makes it sound like the states should do a lot. And on our list over there, we expect a lot of the, the states. Yeah? Well, I can't help thinking, looking at Madison and uh, thinking <laughs> of Virginia, uh -huh. that actually properties of the residents mm -hmm. that has to have been in part driven by the slavery issue. Mm -hmm. I would think and, so. You know, there was an awful lot of horse trading uh, leading up to the ratification of the Constitution around those issues. Yeah. And, you know, that first paragraph looks great, mm -hmm. but if you start thinking about it in context, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily so nice. Right, exactly, yeah. Um, every state gets to regulate the properties of the residents of the states. And if some of the states are slave owning, that's going to provide state protection for that property. For those, uh, what? And liberties. Yeah, right. The liberty, I mean, the, some of the laws around slaves is um, it's kind of amazing. What? And women. And women, yeah. Um, so here's Madison, this came from Federalist number 45. And at the time, uh, people were concerned, well, if we're going to have a, uh, a constitution and give all these powers to the federal government, what's that going to do for these individual states with their ability to control the life, liberties, and properties? And um, at the time, there was this new power that was being talked about, commerce power. And Madison says, does somebody want to be Madison? <laughs> regulation of commerce is a new power that seems to be an addition which few oppose and from which no apprehensions are entertained. Right. So at that time there was, okay, we're going to give, we're going to give um, commerce powers to Congress, but the states have got the real deal. They're doing life, liberties, and properties. Commerce, schmommers. And uh, what he is looking at is Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution, Congress has the power to regulate commerce among the several states. Not within. Not within, just among. So again, should be able to easily balance this. On the one side, we have Commerce Clause. I painted it green for money. On the other side, we have the Tenth Amendment. I colored it blue because um, what people call state powers is usually called police powers. The ability to police, regulate, set laws uh, in order to protect the lives, liberties, and properties of the residents of each of these states. So it looks pretty good. One, it's like our balanced, um, what do we call those? That, uh, oh, that playground equipment? Seesaw. seesaw. It looks like a happy little seesaw. So it's so clear. Commerce Clause controls interstate commerce and not much else. And the Tenth Amendment controls intrastate commerce and what's known as police powers. So should be very happy. Concurrent powers. 
two, two, two powers in one. You remember that gum? Yeah. Ding, ding, two powers in one. With federalism, we get the power of the federal government and we get the power of the states. And that's going to be super happy because they're easily balanced and um, everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing. So it does, not surprisingly, it doesn't take very long for there to be a big clash. And it comes on the Hudson River with two steamboats and one steamboat says, hey, New York gave me the exclusive right to operate steamboats in New York waters. And the other steamboat says, what do you mean? Congress regulates interstate commerce. And so the United States gave me the exclusive, you gave Congress the exclusive right to regulate commerce, and I got this license from Congress. So two steamboats are at war, and it's a pretty famous case, 1824. Gibbons v. Ogden, here's Justice John Marshall, Chief Justice, and he says, New York has the power to inspect and quarantine, to enact health laws of every description, to enact laws regulating the internal commerce of a state. However, America understands the word commerce to comprehend navigation, therefore, New York licensing collides with Congress's commerce power, and after this decision, commerce is big. Little, little state power. Uh, so New York steams ahead with its police powers. I'm going a little fast here. I just want to cover a few cases, and then we can get into the bulk of it. Um, New York hears this decision that Congress is now doing all of the regulating of steamboats. And they, um, not too long thereafter, they pass a law. So this was an 1824 case. 1824, New York law required the master of any vessel to provide a detailed report of every person brought as a passenger in the ship and to post security in case any passenger became a ward of the state. So this is the beginning of states trying to regulate who comes in and who doesn't come in. And on the one hand, it could seem like, uh-oh, it's the wall mentality. It is the wall mentality. And by the same token, there's a lot of infectious diseases happening at this time. So the, New York is a port. A lot of people are coming into this port. They do not want to have these epidemics. And they also don't want poor indigents who then become wards of the state. So that's why they ask the steam, uh, sorry, the masters of vessels to post this bond. And Milne, who was uh, a master of a ship called Emily, was penalized $15,000, that's a significant amount of money, for violation of the act. So he refuses to post that bond. And he says, how come my interstate traveling vessel is subject to New York state law? Reasonable question. Because Gibbons v. Ogden just said, if it's going to be traveling in between the states, that should be regulated by con Congress, not by the individual states. And um, doesn't Congress regulate interstate commerce, if that's the case? I should not have to be following New York law. Mil Milne sues and wins in the lower court. And the New York City mayor appeals to the US Supreme Court. So this is a big case that comes forward. Having just heard not too long ago Gibbons v. Ogden in which Congress got full powers to do all sorts of regulation, um, in 1837, this is Justice Barber's decision. Somebody want to read this first bullet point? New York law is not a regulation of commerce but a police. Right, because the the key piece had to do with infectious diseases and to try and prevent uh, indigents entering into the state. So it wasn't commerce, it was police. There's a lot of um, parallels here to current rhetoric about is it commerce or is it police when we create walls. That's saying that, that therefore New York law does apply in this case. Right, so he's setting the stage. Uh, you want to read this one? The state is as competent to provide precautionary measures against the moral pestilence of paupers, bonds, <laughs> and possibly convicts, as it is to guard against the physical pestilence which may arise from unsound and infectious articles imported. 
Yeah, right. So when it gets reframed as an issue of police, as opposed to commerce, it turns out, sorry, Congress, your powers just shrunk. And whoopee, New York, you are in the driver's seat. So just in a very short period of time, two decisions that in some ways seem quite similar, because they're both about boats coming in and boat, which boat is regulated by whom. Uh, so this one gives a lot of power to the states. So yeah. This is talking about immigration. Yes. And uh, somebody must have changed that law since then because the state governments have no power over immigration. Ah, do <laughs> states have power over immigration? That's a really good question. Uh, and that would be something, so uh, just to make sure everybody heard that, um, this, th because right now Alan is saying states don't have any control over immigration. That's all federal government and, and a federal bureaucracy. And yet, here is a way of understanding how a state, through public health concerns and also concerns about um, not having enough money to take care of indigents, can reframe it and bring it back to the states. So um, that was 1837, and things stay that way for quite a long time until the 1930s when all of a sudden states cannot respond to the financial needs, the agricultural needs, the social needs, the educational needs. Pretty much the whole thing um, is in a mess and we start to see a big shift away from states rights to or state sovereignty to the national government so congress passes the national labor relations act 1935 and here's another case that comes up a steel company in pennsylvania a manufacturing company dismisses 10 employees for engaging in union activities now this is a pennsylvania company that uses Pennsylvania resources, Pennsylvania employees, unlike Vermont. I mean, Vermont, I gather, had a hard time with healthcare because so many of uh, the people who work in Vermont don't live in Vermont. But this steel company made a very strong case. We, everything we're doing is Pennsylvania. We may make something that gets sold, but we're talking about labor relations, people. And this is something the state should have some control over. So the workers sue under the NLRA, claiming unfair labor practices. And the National Labor Relations Board, which still exists, it may be a little weaker, but it does still exist, um, ordered their reinstatement. So this goes to the Supreme Court, not surprisingly, because Pennsylvania is saying this should be under the state law. Pennsylvania did not have unfair labor practices. That's something the feds are forcing down our throat. So it goes to the Supreme Court and we have, this is a big case, NLRB versus Jones and McLaughlin, and Justice Hughes um, makes a decision. Uh, somebody want to read this one, Justice Hughes. Congress's power is plenary. Yeah, so what does that mean, plenary? Trump Janice says, yes, it's total. Um, do you want to keep going? Includes direct and indirect effects on commerce. So this is the narrow edge of the wedge, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So an and, and indirect effect on commerce is going to be labor. Even though it has nothing to do with the goods that then get sold outside, when you have labor unrest in Pennsylvania, that affects the whole interstate commerce. The steel company must abide by the NLRB decision. Yeah, exactly. And then we have, this is the beginning of what they call Commerce Clause jurisprudence. From here on out, um, Commerce Clause does enormous amounts of things for the federal government. So things that were there on our list over there around um, how come Congress is handling it, it was usually under the Commerce Clause. Now, environmental issues, I'm not going to make that claim. Carbon emissions could be, because it has to do with the direct or indirect uh, effect of commerce. It's, uh, or you, you, know, you could make the same claim about uh, pollution put into the waters. So big, big commerce clause. Oh, it's the tiniest it's ever been. They barely exist. Um, 
And that's 1937. So we stay in that realm for the most part um, from 1937 up until pretty recently where if commerce is any part of the mix, Congress is in charge, not the states. Because Congress's commerce clause is plenary. So then we get to marijuana. I think Eddie brought up marijuana earlier. Um, maybe, maybe you all know this case. So California passes Proposition 215, legalizing the use of medical marijuana. That's a 1996 law. And uh, in 2002, Butte County Sheriff's Department destroyed marijuana plants under Controlled Substance Act. That sounds like the, the case you were talking about, Eddie. So somebody could have uh, all the licenses they need, the permission through the state to grow mar uh, medical marijuana. And because of the Controlled Substances Act, the sheriff comes in and destroys it. And somebody named Angel Rach, I don't know how to pronounce that. Anybody else? Uh, she sued, claiming that the CSA, the Controlled Substances Act, violated the Tenth Amendment. Because really, how can you have anything approaching a Tenth Amendment if somebody is legally growing marijuana for their own use, right? This is not being sold out on any sort of market for their own use, and still the feds come in and say, Nope, you don't have that Tenth Amendment right. We get to do this. So that went all the way to the Supreme Court, and it was Justice Stevens, John Paul Stevens. And somebody want to read his decision? The Controlled Substance Act is squarely within Congress's commerce power because production of the commodity meant for home consumption has a substantial effect on supply and demand in the national market. <laughs> right? Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, Aaron, like, can somebody explain this, this, uh, this to Aaron about like how is it that home use of marijuana can have a substantial effect on supply and demand in the national market for that commodity? Yes. Well, it's a five hundred billion dollar industry where the mafia brings it in, and this is restricting the mafia's ability to sell the <laughs> marijuana. Well, and and okay. that and you could say Mar uh, you could say the mafia, or you could now say, I mean, in in the state of Vermont, they're trying to get some big Walmart-style marijuana dispensaries, right? Um, it turns out that's, I mean, that's the case law. There was a case in the Depression that a wheat producer grew some wheat for himself for his own consumption, his homestead consumption, and because that was in excess of the allotment, even though it was just for himself, the Supreme Court said that had a substantial effect on supply and demand in the national market for that commodity. So what is true for wheat in, uh, in the 30s was also true for marijuana. Howard? We seem to be assuming here that national market for that commodity refers to legal market. I'm suggesting that it does not. Because mm -hmm. actually when marijuana is legalized, it creates cover for, for illegal marijuana to be sold because it's actually not possible to tell the difference. So, uh, and I want to make sure that, did everybody hear what Howard said about how we're making this assumption that it's a legal market? But in fact, this could be talking about, do you think that Stevens was, was concerned about the illegal market? I don't know, because, mm -hmm. because, uh, because he isn't telling us. Mm -hmm. And I'm simply pointing out that the assumption that he's referring to a legal market may not in fact be well founded. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, Eddie. Actually, what they're saying in this decision, from when I read about it, mm -hmm. is we're protecting a market that's perfectly illegal. And it's a bad decision, yeah. realistically. Right, yeah. yeah. Right. Literally, they're protecting the black market. It does seem that way, yeah. Uh, Lucia? Also, I mean, just in terms of going back to the original uh, rule of the 1924 court decision, weren't they saying that medical issues work squarely within the states, and this is a medical product, so then that seems also to kind of contradict. Exactly. Yeah. You would think given the decision, the Milne decision, mayor of the city of New York versus Milne, that that would squarely be in the Tenth Amendment because it's a public health issue. So what do the states get to do? 
Um, yeah, after this, we have enormous, big, big commerce power. It, you know, you begin to wonder, like, I should have just scrapped it. Forget it. <laughs> Tenth Amendment. Forget it. Doesn't really matter. Now, there were some dissents in this case. Um, and I, I always like going for these cases, especially if you're somebody who tends to say, oh, I generally go with the liberal justices. Well, John Paul Stevens was a liberal justice. And uh, personally, I, I think that uh, O'Connor raises a pretty good concern about what Stevens just did. Does somebody want to read uh, Justice O'Connor's dissent? Yeah, Kathleen. We, we enforce the outer limits of Congress's Commerce Clause authority, not for their own sake, but to protect historic spheres of state sovereignty from excessive federal encroachment and thereby to maintain the distribution of power fundamental to our federalist system of government. Right. It's like, what's happened, Supreme Court? You have this job. You're supposed to be protecting state sovereignty, and we should be curbing Congress. And then she says something that has become uh, really a classic O'Connor understanding of what should federalism be. Kathleen, you want to read this as well? One of federalism's chief virtues is that it promotes innovation by allowing for the possibility that a single courageous state may, if its citizens choose, serve as a laboratory and try novel social and economic experiments without risk to the rest of the country. Wow. Right. So Ellen, I think, did you use terms like that? I feel like... Well, I said research. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So here's another way of understanding federalism, and this gets at the point that Howard really wanted us to look at. This power goes to the states respectively. That states get to experiment, they get to try something, they get to learn, and we get to learn from each other as opposed to insisting that everything is the same. And then Clarence Thomas, he makes a very strong claim. Somebody want to read Clarence Thomas? One searches the court's opinion in vain for any hint of what aspect of American life is reversed to the state. Is reserved. reserved to the state. And that's right out of the Tenth Amendment, right? Here's a decision that has, the court has completely disregarded any powers to the states. And it takes O'Connor and Thomas to say, what is going on? Um, this case did make some interesting um, coalitions. Uh, I'm really eager to see how this one could continue. <laughs> Somebody who would like to see states' rights taken seriously, I think this Tenth Amendment is important. So here, yes, we were talking about how um, the states' rights can also be, um, I think Ray used the word for um, reinforcing, how did you put it, Ray? I don't want to, um, you said it was like a, a cover-up or a, a Oh, yeah, it was used as a cover for racism right. in the bad old days. Yeah, yeah. So, but this is an, an, an interesting piece, right? So if on the one side you say, I need another dose, can I have my medical marijuana dispensary? Can we also see that there are connections with people who would like to maintain the Confederate flag? And maybe there will be differences amongst them as well, but both of these positions are taking the 10th Amendment seriously. So, um, is the Tenth Amendment a dead letter now in the United States? Well, the states are supposed to be able to handle marriage laws. That was something that states traditionally always did. And there's been a couple of Supreme Court decisions that make that less possible. So we have Roe v. Wade, and then Ray had mentioned earlier, um, Obergefell? Obergefell. Obergefell versus Hodges, which is the same-sex marriage law. So here is a place where the federal government, through the Supreme Court, uh, took away something that belonged to the states. Establishment and, establish and maintain schools, traditionally, within the purview of states. And that has been taken away through Brown versus Board of Education, and No Child Left Behind, there's other examples. And I'm doing this deliberately to say, wow, you may feel like, wow, but I really liked that court decision. That was a great one. And just to understand that there is a cost to it in terms of losing our laboratories, losing the research. Uh, provide for public safety has been something that states traditionally, which is why most criminal cases go through the states, they don't go through the feds. 
But then we just talked about the Controlled Substances Act, which means you, get, you don't get to determine what can be used. Um, yeah. And it's interesting that the Controlled Substances Act is an example of feds using a smokescreen for what was essentially racism at the time it was brought in, since an awful lot of that was anti-Mexican. Uh, and so and it just, I never really put that together with the state's rights smokescreen event. Um, and I will shut up, but there's just one thing I want to add to that which is it's so wonderful to see O'Connor up there, and I think we should all take a moment to think about who the first woman on the Supreme Court was and who appointed her. Right, and she was appointed by Reagan? Reagan. Yeah, right. And I mean, she turned out to be a wonderful justice. And yeah. you know, when she was first appointed, all our liberal friends were very upset. Uh-huh, no. Right, I mean, um, she took the notion that if the federal government is going to take on these kind of powers, what is left to the states? And if the Supreme Court is not gonna hold Congress back, then who's gonna hold Congress back? Um, and so we also have, the, it used to be that the uh, states took care of regulating intrastate commerce. Well, I think that Gonzalez case that we love the medical marijuana makes that one really hard to say that states have any authority over. Um, so in terms of pros and cons of states' rights, the pros of states' rights is we get to have a democratic laboratory. So important. Uh, allows for more local control. And I think, you know, when we went through our list over here, we were looking for things that, we want more control over our soil, we want more control over our air, we want more control over either our reproductive rights, whatever. And if we do it on a state level, there's a notion that maybe that it will be, um, I don't want to make it sound easy, because there's big differences among states, hallelujah. But perhaps because they're more local, there might be more civility because you're counting on somebody to come and help you when your house catches on fire. Um, and it also allows for greater flexibility. That's part of that laboratory idea. Let's try something out in Vermont, or let's try something out in New Hampshire, and then see how it works out, and we can be more flexible because we're a single state. And uh, states' rights people, I think they are legitimate when they say it, decentralization enhances liberty. So that's what states' rights gives us, a more decentralized form of power. The cons of states' rights, and, and I'm happy to add anything to this, is um, it does get confusing and it makes sense to have some sort of commerce power because um, national industries, when they have to create something like a car and one state has this emission and that state has another emission, that can be difficult. Um, it also has the problem of you have a state, you have entrenched interests, you can't get those entrenched, entrenched interests out, uh, so that you get cronyism on states. And um, it also precludes uniform response to national emergency. I don't know sometimes with some of our national emergencies whether a uniform response can even happen, or do we want disparate? responses to some of these. I don't know, but, um, so yes, Kathleen. I don't see that as a con. I see it as a pro, because if each state has has their own um, way to respond to an emergency, mm -hmm. then they're, they're working best for their people. Right, right. And so that would be a reason to stay with states' rights. Yeah. What is the, uh, if, when there's flooding, what's the Vermont response to flooding? Yeah, and it could be very different than then the neighboring state it doesn't yeah. mean it doesn't work, it doesn't mean it wouldn't but be. But they could be in conflict. Right, but they, yeah, and Allison wants to jump well, in. Well, I was going to say, too, I mean, on the other side of that, when you have um, systems that use, for example, different uh, forms of com communication, like different radio frequencies for their communication, then it becomes very much harder to coordinate right. all the action that's happening. Yeah. And, and, I mean, this is one of those pieces where I'm hoping we come away saying, how can we have both and? argue strongly for states' rights and understand that there's going to be places where we need a much more coordinated response and how and could we have Congress maybe playing less of a uh, regulatory, I don't know, a, and more of a coordinating effort. Yeah, Ray, and did you have your hand up? Yeah. Um, I'm thinking, the, the top one there, I'm thinking in California, 
they they uh, uh, have certain emission standards. They were very much in the forefront. Right. Have those actually been overturned by CAFE standards? So the California can't regulate and have more uh, uh, stringent <coughs> emission controls? I'm not sure that's been determined. Yet. Yeah, this, this is what's up in play. Did everybody hear? And I'm sorry, can you tell us our, your name? Jack. Jack. Um, yeah, so, so California was in the news because they have stringent standards for emission, and then if the, if the federal government rolled back CAFE standards, as the uh, Trump administration just did, then what happens under those circumstances? Now, California could make a states' rights argument. We are responsible for protecting the life, liberty, and properties of our people, and we do not, and I think they're making that kind of a case, so under the Tenth Amendment, they should be allowed to do that. Um, for national industries, that's going to be a headache. No, but I mean, no? The, yeah. the car industry makes vehicles to the California standards. They are such a huge market that if California decides it wants, you know, pink lights in the middle of the rear of each vehicle, yeah. guess what? Right. I mean, we're all going to have them. Right. Um, what, what, I mean, the thing about national emergencies is really interesting. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that a governor has to invite the feds in. Yes. And part of what happened with Katrina is that the mayor of mm -hmm. Louisiana, uh, the uh, governor. governor of Louisiana did not call on the feds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the um, that one is kind of caught in the middle still. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, Howard. California does have more stringent vehicular emission standards, but that's not the only thing they have. If you've driven into California, you recall you stop at the border mm -hmm. and they ask you if you have any citrus fruits, and if you do, you're not bringing them in. Is that right? If you're traveling oh, yeah. from Arizona or Nevada into California, interesting. Yeah, so they are able to use their police powers just as the state of New York was in order to protect their, their people. Yeah, and why does that feel important to you in terms of um, California's uh, use of state sovereignty? The, the bringing in of vegetables, was that, is there something important about that? What they're doing is they're keeping out blights that could get into their orchards. Right, right. Which is uh, entirely reasonable because they don't want their uh, an important industry to be destroyed. Exactly, yeah. Um, so it sounds like there's enough people here who are saying maybe that's not a con that um, national industries may have to deal with 50 different sets of regulations. Because, now, if you're California, you're sitting pretty. Or if you're Texas and you're buying textbooks, oh, yeah. then you're sitting pretty. And the, the textbooks will go for Texas, more stringent regulations. But if you're a little state like Vermont, that could actually be somewhat problematic because the standards will get set by the market and whatever state has a greater market share, Rhode Island, you know, what's it going to do? Like GMO labeling. <laughs> right, exactly. Although, although with the car issue, Vermont chose to piggyback okay. on the California rules. Uh -huh. So the California rules were obeyed in Vermont. And when we bought our first new car in New Hampshire, we actually got a car that was made specifically for Vermont and, and California, mm -hmm. rather than one that was made for New Hampshire. And uh -huh. it's got better gas mileage than the ones they were selling for New Hampshire. Interesting, interesting. So you want to know that sort of thing, like, can I, I'm coming over here for your New Hampshire's tax uh, benefits, perhaps, and, but I do want to buy a car that's going to fit uh, Vermont's uh, cleaner air re restrictions, yeah. So um, to start to wrap this up, I'm kind of, I'm curious what it would look like to revive the tenth, because I think we have developed habits where we have ceded power to Congress. And, um, and in doing that, we have lost a very important part of the Bill of Rights. Well, we ceded powers to Congress, really, or have we ceded powers to the Supreme Court? Well, that's a really good question. Did anybody hear that? Yeah, so, so Lucia asked, did we, secede, did we cede powers to Congress, or do we cede it to the Supreme Court? Congress doesn't do anything. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It's everything's decided. I mean, for better or worse, like when if you have 
Supreme Court that is leaning in your direction, you're happy, and if it's <coughs> leaning in the other direction, right? you're pretty bummed. And, and, and maybe one of those litmus tests, I know there's all these different litmus tests, but what would it be like if states' rights became more of a litmus <coughs> test for more people? Because right now, states' rights has become a litmus test for people squarely on the right, and I do think that the left doesn't pay enough attention to the effect of losing states' rights. Because we had a liberal Supreme Court for a long time, and we got really used to getting what we wanted. <laughs> yeah, so Lucia said it's because of the liberal Supreme Court. Everybody thought, oh, that's great. So the Supreme Court is going to do all these great things, Brown versus Board of Education, Roe v. Wade. In some ways, uh, in the, the Ninth Amendment, we had a lot of discussion about Roe v. Wade. Should that get overturned, it'll go back <coughs> to the states. Will we have more laboratories? And maybe that would have an interesting social science experiment. You know, that people would start to make decisions on I'm going to live in this state because I want the right to do X. And I'm going to live in this state because I want to make sure I have the right to do this. And then we'll have this interesting <coughs> experiment. And what would be great is we took very good notes and then could share, so uh, how are our children doing five years down the line? Or how are our schools doing five years down the line? Some sort of metric that everybody agrees on. Um, so I don't know. Yeah. That's, that's easy to find. What? The metric that we all agree on, that's easy to find. I, I'm going to believe that the metric is that we want our children to be able to do better in five years' time. I think that's, I think that's we can count on that. So I got lots of hands up. Um, uh, Kathleen? OK. Um, the predictability piece, when we give to the government, things become a little bit more predictable because of the volume of it. Mm -hmm. It's a little messier when we're individual states doing our own thing. But democracy is messy. Right. So either we embrace the idea that in order to be free to decide, we do need it to be a little bit, a little bit wilder. Yeah, a little bit wilder in order to be free, because we won't be so sure about the outcome. Uh, I think James Madison had a pretty clear understanding of human nature, and many people could uh, disagree with me. I tend to be rather pessimistic. Turns out I have parasites right now. They may be very pessimistic too, who knows? But anyway, James Madison really thought that human beings were avaricious, wanting greedy things, uh, insecure, and were tempted for noble things and ended up making a mess of things. And this form of government, he understood as a way for us to make less of a mess, getting at Kathleen's point about messiness. If there's high concentrations of power, then our messes are going to be greater. If it's smaller, right? And, and, then, and predictable. And predictable. You know, this whole like, wildlife thing is not predictable. Uh-huh. This is the wildlife. Yeah. Yeah. Other thoughts? Uh, Howard, yeah. I have researched a different line of Supreme Court decisions uh, which uh, challenge uh, the assertion that the Tenth, needs to be uh, tenth Amendment needs to be revived. Uh -huh. I, I won't take up much time here, but maybe I'll introduce other aspects later. But here's something I'm quoting here. Judicial enforcement of the Tenth Amendment is essential to maintaining the federal system so carefully designed by the framers and adopted in the Constitution. Garcia versus San Antonio Metropolitan Transit Authority, 469 U.S. 528, 1985. 1985, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's some other cases. The Lopez decision in, I think, 1996? Anyway, mid-90s also puts a break on commerce, uh, Congress's Commerce Clause in order to give states more rights again. Yeah, so there are, and I'm glad you brought that up. I, I'm giving you sort of a dark picture, um, but there are some cases where the, the, the court backed the states. Yeah, Eddie. Um, a lot of problems, we need some serious constitutional issues, also under interstate commerce. Mm -hmm. 99% of the laws that Congress passes is under the Interstate Commerce Clause. Um, you know, they can come up with any excuse. And the beauty of the states' rights is we are not California. 
we have different issues. Mm -hmm. Different things need to be done here. Right. One size does not fit all. Uh -huh. Right, right. And there, and Eddie's right. I mean, so many, uh, we saw that with the marijuana decision that everything is understood as a commerce, as, a, as either having a direct or indirect effect on commerce. And once you have that plenary uh, understanding of what Congress can do, it's very hard to shrink it. Yeah. They can do it with taxes too and necessary and proper, but it's usually commerce is what gets it happening. It, it does make it interesting too though when you're talking about states of such varying sizes and populations. I mean, in New England, it's really hard to do something and just stay in the state of Vermont. I mean, we go to Massachusetts and New Hampshire all the time just because it's closer than getting to most other places in our own state. So that, I mean, that makes it more complicated. If you live in California, you can do everything. I mean, you can spend your whole life in the state of California. It's incredibly easy to do. But yeah doing that where you live in a smaller state, everything is interesting. Everything is interesting. And this is what's made things so hard for, um, you know, the, the health care, the single payer. That was so clear that what was going to get in the way of that insurance, it had so much to do with the fact that we have porous boundaries and there's a lot of people who don't live in the state who work in the state and then it became like they couldn't even solve that. And that's, you know, living in this much more mobile time where people are moving all over the place. So, uh, I mean, I hope that states' rights aren't going to disappear, but uh, yeah, Ray. Well, I mean, we, uh, just to come back to Lucia's point, I mean, we do all drive across the river and shop in New Hampshire to avoid paying 8% tax. I mean, there used to be a Home Depot in Brattleboro, mm -hmm. and people went there until they wanted to buy something expensive, mm -hmm. and then they went to Key. Mm -hmm. So, it's you know, this all sounds like a very abstract discussion, but these are these are decisions we make every day about how we're going. I mean, you know, people settle in New Hampshire, close to Vermont, so they don't pay income tax. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are all making these decisions based on differences between the states already. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, and Kathleen, I just want to respond to the Home Depot thing a second mm -hmm. because one of the reasons that that Home Depot isn't there anymore is because we go to Key. That's what I'm so, saying. So, yeah. I mean, we pay a price every time that we decide something based my, on my monetary, right, based on monetary gain or loss. Right. Uh, one of the concerns of, um, well, I brought this up with the Ninth Amendment, and this comes from Akil Reed Amar, the Yale law professor, and he understands uh, the Ninth Amendment, not as individual rights, but as the rights of the people as a collective following the preamble. Now, I mention that because if we are so interested in individual rights and then we see government as Congress, then we've missed that in-between place, which is the states. And <coughs> if most of our rights-based discussions happen on an individual level, and we, then we say, well, okay, we're going to go to this government and try and get this, the state government, or we're going to go to this uh, national government to try and get this. We've lost this idea of what does it mean to be a collective within individual states. Yeah, Howard. Yes, Professor Omar, at the beginning of his book that he calls the biography of the U.S. Constitution, says, I believe it's on page 11, uh, we, the people of the United States, the first words of the Constitution are, in fact, the most important words in our history. Mm -hmm. And in that regard, I'd like to adduce another aspect of this, because we're talking all the time in terms of, of powers nowadays. But uh, I'd like to go into a little bit here, by your leave, as to how it was viewed, uh, Tenth Amendment was viewed in those days. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, a wonderful source beyond the Federalist and Anti-Federalist papers is uh, Eliot's Debates, which is available via the Library of Congress website. Uh, the, the, the subheading being the debates and the several state conventions on the adoption of the federal constitution, wherein we find Virginia's understanding which, uh, of what was going to happen, which was actually their condition for ratification in 1789. Quote, the powers granted under the Constitution, being derived from the people of the United States, 
may be resumed by them, whensoever the same shall be perverted to their injury or oppression, which is meant via the right of the people to uh, peaceably to assemble, per the, per the Fifth Amendment, uh, including in constitutional convention, per Article 5. Mm -hmm. So in other words, what the Tenth Amendment is, is also saying is, we can at any time take back powers that we have granted via the Constitution to uh, someone else. Right. We the people. Can we do the people. This. Right. Right. Doesn't mean it's easy. Right. <laughs> right. But isn't that? I mean, that is such a beautiful. Thank you so much. I thought I'm going to say a kill Rita Mar, and I'm going to hope that Howard has got it <laughs> right there. You are so beautiful. Um, but this idea that it starts with we the people granting everything, and that the states are the place where we the people began. And we give this to the federal government. If we don't like what's happening to the federal government, yes, it's gonna be hard. It could be very messy. Mm -hmm. It could mean that we'll have to do more of this work for ourselves. We may need to have more town meetings than once a year. But that's, I mean, that's kind of what's being um, offered to us in this idea for us to take that really seriously. You so. And what? We need to vote. And we need to vote, and but then we also need to deliberate. Like, what are we going to do in a national, uh, a natural emergency? When there is a natural disaster, which seemed to be more of, what sort of um, conversations should we be having ahead of time in order to figure out about life, liberty, and property? Yeah, Howard. Should I give a little clarification about the Constitutional Convention for those who may not know what Article 5 says? Yeah, could you tell us what Article 5 says, Howard? That would be great. Well, in this regard, what I'm referring to is Article 5 says that if three quarters of the state legislatures request a Constitutional Convention, mm -hmm. Congress shall call it wow. for the purpose of proposing amendments. Wow. Dude, isn't that great? Okay, so besides voting, I also suggest then we go, go and revisit the Constitution a little bit, because there are little glimmers of, we could anticipate things might be very, very bad further down the road. And it's going to be strange, because you're used to doing things through this big administrative state, but what would it be like to actually take it back and see what's possible? Well, I believe there have, there have been a couple of Republicans that have been calling for a new Constitutional Convention. A couple of Republicans in Congress are calling for a, a new convention. Well, I don't think it's gone as far as, you know, yeah. a bill or anything, but... <coughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so... Calling for it. Interesting to look. I mean, it, this is the sort of thing to, uh, to be following. So, um, anyway, thank you very much, everybody, for coming out. And uh, this will be the last of this series, but as I said, we'll, um, They'll be happening in Brattleboro, second Tuesday of the month, starting in November after the midterm election. We'll go back to the first and work our way through. Anyway, thank you very much. Amendment number nine says that other rights are fine and ten gives the rest to the states. Yo, it's the Bill of Rights, it's the Bill of Your Rights. It's time to take your knowledge up to unfamiliar heights. The thrill of your life, just like riding a bike.